shout and touch the Lord as He passes by. You find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out. Good evening and welcome to Reach Out Fellowship. I'm Jerry Lynn. And I'm Kelly Lynn. And we're going to be talking today about health, help, and safety. And we're going to look at Psalm 3 and in part 2, the next one after this program, Psalm 4, talking about the Lord's help in trouble. And the next program is the Lord's safety for the faithful. Whoa. So we need help. We need and, this message. Uh, we're going to be talking about the help that God gave David as he was fleeing from his son Absalom. And maybe you have a trial in your life right now. You need God's help. So we're going to cover this psalm, and I think you'll be blessed by God's word. We always are, aren't we? So wow. let's bow our hearts before the Lord as Kelly leads us in prayer. Gracious Father, oh, Father, we just thank you so much. We thank you that you are so faithful, Lord. Oh, Lord, you're so faithful to us. I just praise you, Lord. We praise you. We ask that you would be with us now and speak to us through your word. Speak to us individually and corporately, those who will hear in the future. May we truly be changed, strengthened, and anointed with your word. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. This is going to be covering Psalm 3, the Lord's help in trouble. And if you have your Bible handy, you might want to take it and... Uh, work with us. People ask us on YouTube and elsewhere what version we use. We happen to use the New King James Version, but I'm very open to whatever version you have. Uh, Psalm 3, the Lord's help in trouble. We all have need of that help. And we're going to see here that uh, despite enemies, in the first two verses, God sustains us in verses 3 through 6, and he saves us in verses 7 and 8. Now the history of Psalm 3 and Psalm 4, which we're going to cover in part 2 of Help and Safety, is a very sad account of uh, a family problem. Uh, it had been brewing for quite a while and finally it came to a head. David, the king of Israel, the most beloved of God, the most godly of all the kings, had a son, Absalom, who was angry at his father and for quite some time would sit at the city gate. And as people came to have cases heard by David, Absalom would grab them, bring them aside and say, my dad's too busy. He's not interested, but I'm available. Let me help you. I'm on your side. How do you like that? And they that? began to follow him to the point where he had such a large army of people that he then came against his father and drove his father out of the city of Jerusalem, wanting to kill him, his own son, wanting to kill him. And this is the psalm that David writes, as Psalm 4 is that night before the battle where he is struggling with this, but he finds his peace in the Lord. Maybe you've had divisions in your family. You've lost friends, loved ones. Uh, in my family, we've seen children not speak to their parents for long periods of time. Maybe you've experienced that as well. Other kinds of situations we have. But God has help for you in time of trouble. And so let's begin. Uh, we're going to read the whole psalm. Kelly's going to read the psalm. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. He actually had to flee running out of Jerusalem um, and his little group with him to uh, escape his own son who wanted his death. So with that in mind, let's uh, look at Psalm 3 and go right through verses 1 to 8 there. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no, God, no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. 
You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Ooh. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Amen. Amen for his and, word. And uh, your Bible will say the word Selah. I think you probably know that's just a pause. This is actually a song that's been written. Uh, and David wrote this to uh, the choir director. And Selah is just simply to pause the instruments. And uh, that's interesting because sometimes we need a pause just to relax and let the truth of God's praise and worship come into our hearts. Well, today was an unusual day for me because I looked at all the twigs and stuff from the uh, trees and the wind, and uh, I could have spent all day outdoors freezing, uh, picking up the yard. And I said, Lord, what should, what should I do? And he had me mercifully do something quite different. Sit at my computer virtually all day long and do word studies for tonight. So I will either be able to help us to get some enrichment in God's help or bore you to death. I don't want any heads to hit the pews. I don't think our insurance covers that. But we're going to get into some deep word study because we need God's help. And I want to get into David's mind. What was he thinking that night before the battle when his own son was fast upon his heels wanting to kill him? What was he thinking about? Was he spending time saying, woe is me? I was so good to that boy. He, died. he, just, he just turned on me. I'm so angry, I can't stand life. No, he turned to the Lord. When you've got trouble, turn to the Lord. Where else is he going to go? Lord. So we're going to do some word studies. Uh, and let's begin with verse 1. He's talking to the Lord. He's saying, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. <laughs> wow. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. So how about that in your own life? If you had that situation where it seemed like they were all against you? Do you ever have a family member? I see back there, right? Someone you loved? Terrible. There's nothing like it. You might as well take a knife, put it in your heart. Yep. In my own family, I had my, my brother turned on us for seven years. Well, we were all Christians. And, we turned, and he turned on us for seven years. Wouldn't talk to mother or dad for seven years. It just about drove mother crazy. She just I said she would cry and so so sad. And uh, also, I, I love my stepsisters, but one of them hasn't talked to the family for over fifty years. You have your own stories to tell as well. Well, David had his problems, and uh, this wouldn't be the only problem he'd have with his children. And so here he says they've increased to trouble me. He doesn't personify it uh, to Absalom, nor do I with my family, because it's really of the of the devil. And it's really enemies without number. So he doesn't personify it and say, that, that Absalom's a lousy son. He just says, many are they who have increased, they, they trouble me. And many are those who rise up against me. Many who say there's no help for him and God. They're saying God's not going to be any help to him. So the first little word study that I have, I'm going to teach my, my wife, who's got a little bit of Jewish blood in her, mm -hmm. uh, to pronounce a little bit of Hebrew. This is the word help. Look at verse 2. Many are they who say of me, David saying, there's no help for him in God. What's that word help mean, if you pronounce it? It's Yeshua. Yeshua. It means salvation. There's no salvation in Jerry. There's no salvation in Kelly. Also, the word means deliverance. Deliverance. Speak it right out. It means welfare. Welfare. Prosperity. There's prosperity. So they're saying there's no salvation in you. There's no deliverance in you. There's no welfare in you. There's no prosperity in you. And the devil's going to tell you those lies all the time. There's no prosperity in you. You're getting old. COVID has taken away your income. You're not going to be able to make it. You're going to be, you're going to be on the food lines. You're not going to be delivered from this. But there is a savior. When you have Jesus Christ in your heart, this is the word help. What does Jesus mean? If you pronounce it Yeshua from the Hebrew, but it also means help. So when you say help, Lord, you're actually mentioning his name. So that's what his enemies say. Lord, they're saying that there's no help in me. But oh, that's not true. You, O oh Lord, verse 3, but, oh, that word but changes everything, doesn't it? But you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me or a shield, I like this, around me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. So he doesn't dwell on Absalom, doesn't dwell on the enemies, doesn't dwell on those who rise up against him, he doesn't dwell on those who lie and say there's no help in him. 
he dwells on the Lord. Get your focus on the Lord. The more you dwell on your enemies, the more unhappy you're going to be. The more you dwell on the Lord, the happier you're going to be. You're going to find now that we've moved past verses 1 and 2, moved past the enemies, moved past those who have been against him. We're now going to dwell in the Lord. We're going to get on higher ground. Get up on higher ground. You, O Lord, are a shield for me. That word shield is my protection. It's not just a shield in front of me. It's all around me. The Lord is protecting all around. Oh, that's funny because today I was talking to someone and um, I said, you know, um, lately I've been thinking what's going on in the world. And, you know, I, I literally, if you get up and you look at your Facebook and your Instagram and your, uh, all these other rumble and everything, the first thing you see is negativity, evil, evil, this craziness, this law, this, this, all these crazy things are happening, right? And it's so bad that you're like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see anymore. It's just, and so I said to my girlfriend, I said, you know what I, I came to me? That we have to remember the man in the bubble. Remember that kid in the bubble? We have to like, God, we're in a bubble. We got to be in a bubble. Just walk through the world and try not to let all this, let it bounce off of us. Because we can't let all this stuff come on us. Because he's surrounding us with that's a right, shield. That's right. And that's what I, I visioned that. I had that's that right. vision today. That's a good point. The other, the, other, the other morning I was listening to the news and went from channel to channel to channel. And I said, I just can't do this anymore. I just can't <laughs> do it. so I bad. I just turned it off and began it's to so sing to bad. the Lord. Uh, because it was just getting so oppressive. <laughs> but think about a shield all around. Now a shield in front, I can see what's coming at me straight on. Yeah. I've got minimal peripheral vision. I have no vision in my back. Only a mother with six kids has vision in her back, I think. But seriously, none of us have any real vision all the way What's around. Oh, right. No protection all the way around. Right. So Kelly's here to help me. She's my, my soulmate. She's my uh, other half. And she's here to protect me and sometimes correct me. Uh, and that's great. And I've got family and friends here and elsewhere. But that's not all around. The Lord is all around me and all around you. So that shield is all around you, totally protecting you from everything and anyone. And that, that goes for your on top and underneath, everywhere. You are in that bubble, as Kelly said. So Lord, you're a shield for me or around me. You're my glory. God sees you as his glory. And Ephesians says you're going to be in heaven uh, with him, not just in the future, right now you are in heaven with him in heavenly places. He's showing off his glory in you. Look at what I've done for Jerry. Look what I've done for Kelly. Sinners, and I've saved them by my precious blood, and brought my righteousness to them, and they are my glory. They're my, I call Jesus, I call him, my, myself, I call him my trophy wife. I'm, I'm Jesus' trophy wife, and so are you. And he's just showing me off. They're the work of his hands. You're my, my glory, Lord. You're the one who lifts up my head. Do you think in the natural he wanted to have his head down that night? Think about it. Absalom is on his heels. He had escaped through the, he had come down through the, you've all seen the skyline of Jerusalem. He'd come through the gate. He'd gone down into the little valley called the Kidron Valley, gone up to the Mount of Olives where the photographer takes the picture of the skyline and he's running and he's trying to escape his son. You think his head is down? Well, he says, my head is down naturally, perhaps, but Lord, you're lifting my head. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do a little bit of research on that word. What does it mean to lift your head? Because my wife needed to have her head lifted. And because I'm the other half, I didn't know what the problem was, but I was very down today. And that's why I got into this word study. I thought it was for me, but it was also for her because I was feeling something from her feeling her pain in some sense, but didn't know what was going on. You still, can feel that spiritually, know. right? Still don't know what it is, and I might never know. But in any event, lifts up. What does it mean to lift up your head? Verse 3, what is that word in the Hebrew, my dear? Uh, and how do you pronounce that word? Room. Room. See, that, see the Hebrew she knows? <laughs> <laughs> and what does it mean? It means to rise, to rise up, to be high, to be lofty, to be exalted. This is when his son is chasing him and wants to kill him. Lord, you're the one that lifts my head. I need to be lifted. I need to be high. I need to be exalted. Not in self, but in Christ. In the world, we try to lift ourselves up, show, our, show how great we are. We grandstand. We see our politicians, Democrats, Republicans, 
and others as well. All, not all, but many of them showcasing just for the camera. And the Lord says, if you lift yourself up, I'm going to take you on down. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So you humble yourself. David was humble at that point, And he was desperate. He wasn't expecting an attack, least of all from his own son. He was a great warrior. He was a general, but he wasn't prepared in battle and certainly not for his own family. And sometimes we know about the enemy outside and we're prepared for that. But the enemy in our own families, the enemy within our close confidants, and David had that. Because who did Absalom choose to side with him against his father? David's trusted counselor, his number one man, Ahithophel. Somehow, Absalom had gotten to Ahithophel and gotten him to side with the son instead of the father. And so David has a psalm about that, a psalm that becomes a foreshadowing of Jesus being more betrayed by, by Judas. Have you ever been betrayed by someone you really trusted? Sometimes it's the closest kid to you. You, you, love, you love all the kids, but there was one that was a, a little bit more heart to heart. And that one turns on you. How do you feel? You get your eyes on Jesus. You just get your eyes on the Lord. And so, Lord, I need my head to be lifted up. And maybe somebody watching on television or by YouTube needs to, to have your head lifted up. Just turn to Jesus. Lord, lift me up in you. And he will do that. So in verse 4, he says, I cried to the Lord with my voice. You think cried meant just loud or that he actually cried? Probably a little of both. Probably was wailing at that point. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. You said you cried today. Mm. And God uh, used that, those tears. He's going to use those tears and he, he stores every one of them in a precious bottle and he's going he's to touch you and he's going to heal you. I cried to the Lord with my voice. Well, he heard me. We're real people, right? We have feelings. People forget just because Christians are saved and they have Jesus, we have feelings, right? We're passionate, we're angry, we get sad, we get lonely, we get hurt. Mm -hmm. That's what he was going through. Can you imagine? Yeah, he cried. You can't really mm -hmm. imagine it until it's really happening to you. That's right. And he says here that the Lord heard me. And that's, that translation is not the best. Some of the more modern translations have it better. Mm -hmm. And he answered me. He not only heard, but he answered me. He's going to answer you. When you cry out to him, he will hear you. Amen. All right. He goes on to say, I lay down and slept. <laughs> but Absalom is chasing you from the city. Well, I lay down. He was exhausted after he, he cried. <laughs> but I lay down and I slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. Amen. So it's the next day. And I'm sure David, that the troops are all getting ready, but the ones that have their swords there. Yes. David says, hold on, I'm writing Psalm number three. And he's got to write it all out before they, they've got to take a little break. You have breakfast. I'm going to have the Psalm here. He said, I, I laid down. I had a good night's sleep. Amen. And I awoke for the Lord sustained me. So the word sustained, honey, give me the Hebrew on that one, would you? Psalmac. That's exactly right. What, what a Hebrew scholar she is, isn't it? Psalmac. You know what that means? It means to lean or lay upon. He laid upon the Lord. He rested upon him. He leaned against him. He was sustained by the Lord. He was refreshed and revived. He woke up the next morning. He was refreshed. He was revived because he trusted in the Lord. I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. And now here's his declaration, verse 6. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. He's not talking about Absalom alone, because he had a lot of enemies. He had the, 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 uh, the Edomites, the Moabites, he had the Ammonites, he had the Philistines, he had all sorts of folks against him. And you and I do as well, but God is able to sustain us. I'm not going to be afraid. And that word afraid in the Hebrew, honey, is? Yare. Yare, and it means to? Fear, revere, be afraid. Be awed, be astonished. Do not be astonished at your enemies. COVID-19, variants, I'm not saying be cavalier about it. I'm not saying not to wear your mask and be socially distant. Yeah. But don't live in fear. You don't have to live in fear, though. Oh my God, there's another variant, or I'm going to lose my income, or this or that. The well, media uses a lot of that to fear monger us, too. We have, God is greater, right? We use precautions. Mm -hmm. 
You yeah. know, I work at the hospital or whatever. I go teach or whatever. I'm, I'm going to be near someone sick. I'm not going to go, hi, without a mask. Yeah. I'm going to obey the rules. And of course, I don't want to get sick. But don't be in fear. Don't but be astonished at the world. We don't want to live in fear either. No, 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 no. No, don't be afraid. He said, I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me round about. And finally, in verses 7 and 8. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Wow. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. So he says, arise, Lord. So he doesn't get into his fears and his anger. He says, arise, Lord and save me. And uh, that word save is the word yasa. Yasha. To be liberated. Read that. Too. To be liberated, be saved, be delivered, be victorious, to save from moral troubles. So God is your Lord, savior. Save me. save me, Lord. Cry it out. Save me, Lord. I'm tempted. I'm in fear. I'm angry. I, I've got, got problems and this save and that. Save me, Lord. Lord, save me. Lord, please save me. For you already have struck my enemies on the cheekbone. He's already gotten the, the victory over those enemies. You've broken the teeth of the ungodly. And salvation belongs to the Lord. And that word salvation is the most important of words. It is... Yes Yeshua. Yeshua. Oh, Yeshua. <laughs> it means salvation. Salvation, deliverance, welfare, prosperity, and victory. You will call his name Yeshua. Jesus, the angel said to, Je to Mary. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. Lord, be my savior, be my deliverer, the one who provides my welfare, my prosperity, my victory. Amen. And then finally, your blessing is, is upon, upon your, your people. people. And the word for blessing is Beraqua. Baraha. 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 It means blessing. Blessing. Prosperity. Prosperity. A gift. A gift. Present. Present. Treaty of peace. Treaty of peace. That's the blessings of the Lord. Baraqua. Baraqua. Now, do tune in to the next it's program, which is going to be Hebrew. part two, uh, Psalm four. Baraqua. And uh, that's a, may you have a blessing. So you can say to someone, I like that Baraqua. word. Now, you know why I like that word. It means yeah. blessing. It means blessing. It's really striking me. That's right. So tune in to uh, part two, which is Psalm four. He continues. And he, can, he has another psalm, so the troops have to wait until he gets all these psalms written, and then off they go for the victory over Absalom. Close us in prayer, Adam, would you? Father God, we thank you for this beautiful, beautiful, what is this word? Baraqua? Baraqua. Baraqua. I can't say it. Baraqua. It's actually, it's, um, Baraqua. It's actually Baraqua. Baraqua. I'm going to have to prep. You've got to get the hood. <laughs> Thank you for this <clears throat> blessing, Father. We just praise you and thank you. You're so good to us, Lord. You're just so good to us. And we thank you, even how this lines up with uh, what people are going through this day. We know that, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you work and you talk to your people. Father, help us to truly be people of God. And thank you that you do bless your people. We ask now your blessing upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening in the Lord. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Hi, welcome to Reach Out Fellowship. I'm Jerry Lynn. And I'm Kelly Lynn. And tonight we're going to be talking about the safety that we have in the Lord. Our title is actually The Lord's Safety for the Faithful in Psalm 4. And we're going to be looking at the Psalm of David as he is being chased out of Jerusalem by his own son, Absalom, who has rebelled against his father and wants to take over the throne. Mm. It's a terrible time in David's life, but David comforts himself in the Lord and gives us an example of how our safety is in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's open in prayer, shall we? Father God, we just thank you that we can come before you and know that, Lord, no matter what is happening around us, that our safety is in you. Help us, Lord, to be in you, under your protection and to obey your word, obey you, and to hear from you, Lord, and to really walk out your truth in our life. Be our safety, Lord. We know you are. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Again, the scene is David is king of Israel. And his son is jealous of him. David had some problems with some of his children and uh, some real, real problems. And uh, with Absalom, Absalom was trying to take over 
Uh, he would stand by the city gate when people came to David to be having their cases heard, and he'd say, let me hear the case instead. I have time. I care for you more. I love you. Wow. And so he began to build an army against his father, and then he came into the city to kill his father. The father had to leave. To leave. He had to flee down the Kidron Valley, on up to the Mount of Olives, and on up into the is this, wilderness. Is there an Absalom spirit? Is that, That's exactly I've right. I've heard about that sure. Absalom that spirit. That Absalom spirit is a spirit of jealousy, Whoa. wanting to take over. So anytime there's a spirit of wanting to take over for somebody else, that's a spirit of Absalom. And so here uh, we find David is fleeing from Absalom. His heart's broken. His own son wants to kill him and take over the throne when God has certainly appointed David to be king of Israel, not Mother. Absalom. And so consequently, we Terrible. find here that David is comforting himself in the Lord. We saw in our part one of this series, Psalm 3, how he gave it to the Lord, he trusted in the Lord, he laid down, he slept, he had peace and rest because he had put the problem on the altar before the Lord. When you and I have enemies of whatever sort, problems of whatever sort, give it to the Lord. He loves us. He cares for us. Put it at the he feet is of well Jesus. He well able to handle it. So Kelly is going to uh, read uh, Psalm 4 to us, and then we're going to talk about it. And I'm going to give a little bit of a word study, which I hope will help us to understand what David was thinking about in his own heart. So let's begin with Psalm 4, verse 1. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long, O oh, you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Wow. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart. More than in the season that their grain and wine increased, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Oh. Amen. The what a safety. beautiful song. You know, my husband, I said, why do we have to go back to Psalms when we finished? What did we finish last time? Psalm 1 Proverbs, Proverbs. Proverbs, yeah. So he said, <clears throat> I, don't, I said, I don't really want to go to Psalms. And he said, well, I was feeling the Lord wants us to do Psalms. And I said, well, he goes, you want to do some stories? And I said, you know, the stories in the Old Testament, because he knows I love the Old, Te Old Testament. I said, yeah. And uh, he goes, well, we can do those. And I said, well, maybe the Lord wants us to do this in Psalms. So I said, well, why don't you do some Psalms? Because right now there's a lot of stuff going on in the country. So we did one and two and three and four. And I cannot tell you how the Lord is speaking to me in these Psalms. He knows. He knows. All right, let's uh, look at this now. And uh, I spent a good part of the day in word studies to encourage myself and to hopefully encourage all of us. Uh, as we know what David meant by these words, uh, there's so much richness in the Hebrew uh, language, uh, much more so than our English language. And so we're going to do some word studies that really take some of these blessings from the Lord and amplify them for us. Mm. So here's David. Again, he has been, uh, he, this is actually a song. All the Psalms are songs. This is their hymn book. Mm -hmm. This is the hymn book of Israel. And so he is giving this instruction to the chief musician or the choir director. Mm -hmm. And uh, with stringed instruments, he wants to, David not only uh, wrote these songs, he designed and uh, created instruments of worship. He said uh, he had 24 hour a day worship. Of, can you imagine being a, a worshiper of the Lord Wouldn't 24 great, hours mother? a day? Uh, they had them in shifts. Uh, but can you imagine having teams of people 24 hours a day in the temple worshiping the Lord? Well, he also designed which instruments, just like a, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the great uh, writers of, of uh, orchestras and what have you would say strings or, or, or whatever uh, instruments. So these are for stringed instruments, and it's a psalm of David. And here's the song, and it begins, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Right off the bat, we know that David is on solid ground because he's not talking about his righteousness. He's talking about God's righteousness. When you and I say, I'm righteous, and I'm going to get to heaven on my own good works, we are in deep, 
deep trouble. Because the Bible tells us the heart of man is desperately wicked. And who can know it? There's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Lord, you're my righteousness. God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Well, I wanted to go into the Strong's Concordance. And uh, I'm not going to try to razzle-dazzle you or uh, impress you with my Hebrew. Uh, yes, I went through seminary. But you know what I use for my Hebrew? I go to the Strong's. Uh, go online and go to the Bible with Strong's Concordance. And they'll tell you what these, word, these words mean. And Kelly is going to just give you the Hebrew of this. Uh, and the word relieved, he says, you have relieved me in my distress. Are you feeling relieved or are you feeling the need for relief? The word relieved means... Rachab. 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 Yeah, you got to do the ha in there, right? The ha. Rachab. And it means, I like this. Wide, large, make room to be widened, be enlarged, broad or roomy pasture. The last couple of days I have been feeling kind of restricted. Some things I'm wrestling with, some uh, decisions to be made. And uh, I've been feeling compressed. When you are in distress, you feel tight, don't you? You feel between a rock and a hard place. You feel narrow. You feel you confined. You feel restricted. But David says, when I go to the Lord, <clears throat> you've relieved me in my distress. That means that now I'm in a wide open space. I see possibilities. Remember that old song, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Oh, yeah, I do that. I remember that song? So that, one, that was that? another trial. Yeah. But I can see clearly now. <laughs> it's a, it's a, suddenly, and today, the, the, after working with this and going through this study, it began to open up. It, I, I, all day long, I was in this, this dark, confined area, and then suddenly around 4 o'clock, it began to lift, and the sun began to shine spiritually. And I began to feel like I was in a large place. And I could say what, uh, what uh, Jabez said, increase my borders, Lord widen the room. So now he's, he says, you've relieved me or brought me into a wide place now in my distress. What does that word distress mean in the Hebrew? It's the word tsar. 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 It's an enemy. It's an adversary. It's trouble. And again, it means narrow. It means tight. Distress is narrow and tight, but relief from the Lord is wide and open. And that's what we need. To You're not do. restricted. That's right. We need that. And so he says, have mercy on me, O Lord. And hear my prayer. Mm. Verse 2, read that again, honey. How long, O oh you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? That's very interesting. How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? So your enemies are out there to... Now again, he's not, he's not being specific. Uh, my son Absalom is chasing me and wants to kill me and take over the throne. No, he says, O oh you sons of men. I'm glad he was more general because... If he was so specific, that song was only good for that time. Only good for a day or two, and then the whole thing was resolved. David did end up, his army did kill Absalom. But he makes it general. And so my mother used to say, when you're going through a problem, pray for all the others in the world who are going through the same problem. Get it beyond yourself. So I'm glad that he's vague here because it's so vague that it applies to anybody at any time in any situation. Oh, you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? Kelly was feeling that today. I don't know the specifics of it, but she told me when she came in that she was crying all day long. Her glory in the Lord was, was, was just being threatened by the enemy. Somebody trying to shame her, prayer, maybe, I don't know. But the enemy's going to try to shame you. How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? Your enemies are, are loving worthlessness and their lies, falsehoods. The word silah just simply means a pause in the, in the music. But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. So he's getting his eyes on the Lord and he says, you know, I belong to the Lord. I'm godly. And he's setting me apart. And what does it mean? Uh, give us the Hebrew on the word set apart. Paula. Paula. It means? To be distinct, marked out, separated, Distinguish to be wonderful. Yeah, that's a new one. I hadn't seen that before. Wow. I had the same I, reaction you did. Yes. Honey. And uh, I, pardon me for calling her honey. Uh, my wife would not be pleased with that. Oh, that is my wife. So uh, one of our dear members said, you know, it's a little bit 
tiresome when you talk on the radio about your wife and you call her dear and honey. It's just old habit. Please forgive me, would you? <laughs> but uh, yeah, she, she, she enjoys it and I enjoy saying it. You know, I, I knew set apart meant set apart. And there's sometimes I'm thinking, Jerry is set apart for God to work through and put through hard times and somehow let the glory of God. He sets me apart to be wonderful. Wow. And he looks at you as, as a child of God and says, you're wonderful. Wow, that's really good. I think that's the greatest revelation I saw today. I'm wonderful because I'm in Christ. Tell them you, have a law, you not only had a law degree, but you studied what? Too much. <laughs> Language. Uh, so he much. loves to pull uh, too, the words too much. apart. Too, too much. Boring. Anyway, mm -hmm. God says, you're, you're marked out. You're distinguished as well. Mm -hmm. When you're set apart, God says you're distinguished and you're wonderful. That's how he sees you. Well, make sure that that other Christian that you're criticizing, that one's also wonderful and distinguished. Be careful. All right, the, the blood Lord's, of Jesus uh, covers amen. our sins, right? Amen. He says, uh, know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. You've been set apart for the Lord. And what does it mean to be godly? Holy, merciful, faithful, kind, pious. That's right. You're his, and you're godly in Christ. Amen. So now this is interesting. Verse 4, I had a little bit of research on this one. Let me read verse 4 and 5, honey. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Be angry and do not sin. I used to tell my kids that all the Meditate time. Meditate within your heart on your bed. Now, I'm good at being angry. But you do not but, but sin. The, without sin is the tough part for me to get that right. And uh, we're going to show you how to do that tonight in this one, these verses. This is going to show you how to be angry and not sin. Now, you don't need to be angry. God's not saying to be angry. But if you are going to be angry... But do not sin. Do not sin. So you could be angry at someone, something, but you're not going to go break windows, get even, be vindictive... Who was, who was it? I was talking to somebody actually today about being vindictive, somebody else who was angry. And I said, we, we just, we have to put that away. We can't, you know, we have to put away the vindictiveness. Let mm -hmm. the Lord deal with it. That's right. That's right. Because we all want to respond in ways that are on, you know, when you're angry, because we're passionate, we're real people. We have to remember that we're real people with real we're humans. I always tell people we're humans. You know, first of all, you're a human, so you're going to respond. You're going to be sad. You're going to get upset. You're going to be mad. But how do we do it without sinning That's against right. others? That's right. Now, he's going to show us how to do that. Now, be angry. Let's get the, the Hebrew on that as the word. Ragaz. Ragaz. That's right. And usually the, uh, the emphasis is on the latter part of a word in the Hebrew. And uh, it's ragaz. He's constantly and, trying um, to teach me how to... The, the Hebrew, <laughs> I don't know that much. Anyway, to be angry, it means to tremble, quake. Rage, quiver, be agitated, be excited, be perturbed. We all know what anger is, don't we? Sure. Well, when you're angry, here is your solution. Don't pick up something and throw it. Don't curse, don't yell, don't kick the dog, throw the cat out. Here's how you handle it, verse 4. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Read it again. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Read it one more time. Meditate within your heart <laughs> on your bed and be still. All right. So, the word meditate. Let's look at that for a moment. That one's uh, this word here. Omar. That's right, Omar. To say, to answer, to say in one's heart, to think, to command, to promise, to intend. In other words, in your heart, talk to yourself. Don't be angry and yell at somebody else. Talk to yourself. My mother used to say, talk like a Dutch uncle, whatever that meant. Give yourself a good talking to. David gives an example, Psalm 42, 43. He, he talks to himself and says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? I will yet hope in God, the help of my strength Whoa. and my countenance. What's your problem, self? That's your problem? really good. Didn't, Robin's shaking her head over that. Yes. Talk to yourself. Mother, yeah, that's really good. So you, you think, you're, and also command. Self, knock it off. 
Self, knock it off. Promise, it means knock it off, I'm going to give it to God. Knock it off, I'm going to give it to God. Intent. I'm going to pray for a healing in this situation and for a better attitude, and I'm going to pray for you, Lord, to show me how to handle this. And as I'm looking at that person that I think is a real snard, or whatever word you want to use, Lord, change me. Change me and forgive me for my sins. So you meditate, mm-hmm. and then he says, be still. What's that word in Hebrew? Doaman. Doaman, right? Doaman. It means? Doaman. To be silent, be still, wait, be dumb. Be dumb. I like that one there. So here you are, you're, you're fuming, but now you're meditating, you're talking to yourself, and instead of telling the world, when you get angry, you want to tell the whole world how you feel. And if you've got Facebook handy, let's let the, let the 10 million people know about it. And uh, certainly scream and yell so that all the neighbors will hear about it, right? Open the back door, go out on the back porch, and yell for all the neighbors. No, be still. Be dumb. What does that mean to be dumb? Shut up. Quiet. Don't and talk. listen. Shut up. Shut your mouth. Be listening. And then God's going to talk to you. Because there is a, a righteous anger and an unrighteous anger. And it's pretty obvious which is which. Jesus was angry when he drove the money changers out of the temple. Remember that? Mm. Both at the beginning and the end of his ministry. Yes. So there were times when he was angry, but it was righteous. It was not selfish. Righteous for the glory of God. I'm not angry with individuals, but it breaks my heart and I'm angry over the sins of man uh, and whatever those sins might be. Uh, And so I'm angry But if it's selfish, and most of our anger is selfish, let's be honest, that's wrong. So Lord, I need to stow it. I need to be quiet. I need to shut up. I need to get my heart right, give it to you, and work on mending and restoring relationships. Be angry, do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed, right there in bed, and be still. Shut up. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. And that is a sacrifice right there. That's right. When you give it to the Lord and you meditate, we're sacrificing unto the Lord. That's right. And you're coming to the Lord with the sacrifice that he now recognizes in the New Testament, hmm. the blood of Jesus Christ. And prayer, meditation. That's right. And you put your trust in him. I'm going to trust in you, Lord. So you did that. You're going to probably fall asleep and relax. And the next morning, you didn't have to say, I'm sorry for yelling and kicking His and screaming. His mercies are new every morning, aren't yeah. they? Amen. So that's, that's your answer there, to meditate uh, and be still. And then verse 6. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart, more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. So there are those who will say, show us any good. Can God really show himself good? He doesn't exist. He's not going to be able to help in that area. So Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Show them your goodness. Show them who you are, Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. Okay, so those detractors of yours, they, they, they did well. They have grain, they have wine. But Lord, the joy that I have in you is far better than that. Oh, Far better Nothing's than Nothing's better than Jesus, right? Yeah. I, I, looked at, I looked at a map this morning, a map that'll just start your day off right. The wealthiest billionaire in every state in the country. And it starts with Seattle, Washington, with this guy, ends up with the one in... in so why and are you I watching thought, that news? <laughs> and this, I just looked at this map to see who was what here. And I thought, I have the wealth that's beyond imagination. I have Jesus, and I hope that those individuals do as well. You have an inheritance in heaven. That's in heaven, absolutely. To be not just an heir of Jesus, but a joint heir. Little Chloe said on Sunday she wants a mansion, she told her grandmother. (laughs) Little six-year-old Chloe. Well, she knows the scripture. Their grandmother taught her about the mansions in heaven, right? I got a mansion just over the hilltop. Amen. So here he's going to finally now, again, the, the, the reports are coming, the scouts are out, and they're letting them know Absalom is just a matter of a half a mile away, a mile away. He's coming to kill you. And David, what are you doing writing with a pen and, and, and ink? Come on, get your, get your sword on. Your son's coming to kill you. And he's there scribbling all these <laughs> wonderful verses of praise. He's got total peace. And then he says, finally, in verse 8, 
I will both lie down in peace and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Uh, so he's going to lie down and sleep. I used to say that scripture all the time. You alone make me dwell in safety. Mm -hmm. And for the final word study, and I hope I didn't bore you too much with this, it's my favorite word in the Hebrew. Shalom. Shalom. And listen to what it means. We say shalom. It's the greeting when you say hello, and it's the greeting when you say goodbye. But when you say shalom, it's got a little more meaning than see ya, or whatever the, the, the vernacular is here in this country, or later. Listen to what shalom means. Completeness, soundness, Welfare, peace, health, prosperity, quiet, tranquility, contentment. When so we should that, just say shalom to just people. Just say shalom. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply.